The world's finest artworks are admired by millions every year who visit countless museums, holy places, and auction houses just to glimpse the brilliance of the past and modern masters. To be in the presence of the finest art can lift the spirit in countless ways, and billions of dollars are paid every year for the privilege. But the art world has a dark side, and the astonishing phenomenon of forgery might change the way a person looks at a painting forever. One early afternoon in the extraordinarily hot year of 1910, the artist Auguste Rodin sat in a wicker chair across from the writer, Paul Cassell, and expounded on his theories of art and its place in the human experience. Rodin was in a prime position to declaim on the topic, for he was well into his 70s that scorching summer, and he had been among France's most prominent artists since winning the commission for his unfinished work, The Gates of Hell, in 1880. Since then, he had completed numerous masterpieces and received the acclaim of critics. His 1904 sculpture, The Thinker, is one of the few compositions that is instantly recognizable on sight to art lovers across the world. But before we explore how the lines between high art and low commerce intertwine, if you are interested in early access to videos and live chats with the creator of Intrigued Mind, consider subscribing to our Patreon. Your support will greatly help us keep the channel producing more intriguing content. Sharing his lifetime of wisdom with Cassell, Rodin said, Art is contemplation. It is the pleasure of the mind which searches into nature and which there divines the spirit by which nature herself is animated. It is the joy of the intellect which sees clearly into the universe and which recreates it with conscientious vision. Art is the most sublime mission of man since it is the expression of thought seeking to understand the world and to make it understood. Rodin's rousing and inspiring philosophy is obviously shared by many because the art industry in 2022 reached its highest market value in history, almost $68 billion, giving a lot of people a reason for celebration. The largest national market for art in that vast trade remains the United States, while Britain overtook the People's Republic of China for second place. With such large sums of money involved, it is perhaps unsurprising that the art world has seen an inordinate and sometimes fantastic amount of forgery in recent decades. And the shadowy underworld of fake art dealing is just as healthy and robust as its genuine counterpart. Indeed, while Rodin's statement encapsulates a notion on which all creativity would ideally base itself, his admirer, Oscar Wilde, made an observation that was just as valid some years before, in an essay published in the 19th century literary magazine, Lying. Wilde said, The telling of untrue beautiful things is the proper aim of art. In a world where the International Monetary Fund estimates that the fraudulent art industry is worth more than $6 billion alone, it seems that Oscar Wilde, as usual, was onto something. Of course, art getting passed off as the work of older or more established artists, thus exponentially increasing its value, is nothing new. During the Renaissance, for example, originality was not so prized as it is nowadays. Form, inspired by the ideals of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, as well as subject, was paramount above all other considerations. In the 15th and 16th century artist workshops of Italy, art was treated as an industry, and apprentices in their early teens learned by copying the work of the master every day. Only when they could reproduce the artist's style to a T would an acolyte be allowed to work on commissioned works. One such apprentice was Michelangelo Buonarroti who early in his career as an independent artist was involved in an art scam of his own. When Michelangelo was aged just 21, his patron, Lorenzo de Pierfrancesco de' Medici, bought a miniature statue of John the Baptist from him. The Medici were as well known for their enterprising nature as their sponsorship of the arts, but Lorenzo, who had also employed Botticelli to create the world-famous Birth of Venus, asked Michelangelo for an extraordinary modification. He requested that Michelangelo make it appear that the statue had been buried and aged, thus giving it the appearance of a piece from the time of the ancient Romans. Interest in antiquity was at a fever pitch across Italy, especially since the rediscovery of Nero's Golden House Palace in Rome a decade before, and Lorenzo was sure that he could fetch a higher price for the statue in Rome if it were passed off as an antique. Michelangelo duly provided the reworked statue, and it was sold to a cardinal, but the scam did not have the result that either man envisioned when they embarked on the deception. The middleman in the deal, Baldassare de Milanese, paid only 30 ducats in Florence for the statue, but sold it to the cardinal for 200. At first, the cardinal was very pleased with his purchase. However, he soon learned the truth of its origin and dispatched one of his agents to hunt down the artist who had committed the fraud. When the cardinal's man eventually found Michelangelo in his workshop in Florence and he saw the young artist's capabilities with both sculpture and drawing, he immediately invited Michelangelo to Rome. The scandal made Michelangelo's name in the Eternal City, 
And though the Cardinal never paid Michelangelo any of the money he retrieved from the agent, within two years, he had been commissioned to complete his first great masterpiece, the Pieta. After that, Michelangelo's status as one of Italy's greatest artists was assured, and he would go on to create the masterpieces of culture like the Sistine Chapel and the Statue of David that the world still flocks to see every year. While this was a case of outright fraud on the part of the artist, patron, and dealer, the line of what constituted genuine work and counterfeit was often blurred. The 17th century Flemish artist, Peter Paul Rubens, is a case in point. Rubens was a well-known and greatly admired artist in his day, but in the century since, his work has become associated with the widespread usage of apprentices and subcontractors to fulfill commissions. This was nothing new, for it was known that artists like Raphael and Michelangelo often used their apprentices to fill in simpler sections of very large canvases, while the masters themselves would concentrate on more difficult sections like the hands and feet. This would allow the artist to complete the work much more quickly, and so accept more commissions for pay. Michelangelo's solitary work on the Sistine Chapel became so famous in part because he seems to have worked on it almost completely alone for four years. His rival, Raphael, meanwhile, had a private joke at the expense of Michelangelo by including him in his painting of the School of Athens, which depicted the giants of art, science, and culture from antiquity to his own period, but drawing Michelangelo in a huge pair of purple boots, the only figure not barefoot, as he would never lower himself to drawing his competitor's feet. In the case of Rubens, so many of his paintings were completed with the assistance of his subordinates or even created without his involvement entirely that nowadays his works are divided into three distinct classes, those Rubens painted himself, those in which he handled the intricate details like faces, hands, and feet, and those that were painted by apprentices from his sketches and supervision. Working in this manner in the 21st century would seem dishonest, but that attitude would not be understood by Rubens or his contemporaries, as Anna Tummers and Conrad Jonquier discuss at length in their 2009 book, Art Market and Connoisseurship, a closer look at the paintings by Rembrandt, Rubens, and their contemporaries. The notion of singular or individual genius was largely an invention of the 19th century. It is anachronistic to apply such ethical standards to what was everyday practice in previous eras. Much the same thing occurred in popular music during the 1960s, when artists like Bob Dylan and the Beatles emerged, writing and performing their own material, and the studio system of having a divide between writers, producers, and performers was suddenly obsolete. The myth of the solitary genius, envisioning and producing their work alone, whatever their medium of art, has become indelibly pervasive over the last half century. At the same time, the modern market for fraudulent works of art has produced some stunning stories and continues to do so as the art industry continues to expand to new levels in terms of dollar value. One of the most spectacular and perhaps little known in the Western world was the theft of more than 140 works of art from the Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts by its chief librarian, Xiao Yuan. Yuan, who likely committed the theft between 2004 and 2006, but was not discovered until 2010, replaced all of the stolen artworks with forgeries. It is estimated that he made between three and four million dollars from sales of the art, which he used to live a more lavish lifestyle and buy a better home. Yuan said he was not proud of what he had done, but it was his contention that many of the works at the museum were counterfeit fakes even before his arrival. Other art forgers are driven by more than simple greed. The British art forger Tom Keating, for example, claimed that his intention in copying thousands of works from hundreds of artists was to highlight the work of painters who had died in obscurity or poverty. Keating employed old techniques in aging his works, which were highly acclaimed after his scam was revealed in a mid-1970s Times article, such as flicking Nescafe coffee and vacuum cleaner dust at his paintings to simulate a mildewed appearance. He was often given to leaving hidden messages and notes like, ever been had on his forgeries. Keating faced trial at the Old Bailey after his arrest in 1977, but injuries from a motorcycle accident combined with ill health brought on by decades of smoking and exposure to the fumes of art-related chemicals meant that the Crown dropped the charges and he went free. His accomplice, Jane Kelly, had pleaded innocence and was given a suspended sentence. Once the stress of the trial was removed, Keating's health rallied and he became a celebrity in the United Kingdom, presenting two television programs for the BBC and later Channel 4 demonstrating the techniques of the artistic masters to the public in their millions. His works are now collector's items in themselves, and Keating paintings, even the fakes, command high prices. Another pair of British forgers who employed the vacuum cleaner technique were John Myatt and John Drew. Their collaboration started in the early mid-1980s after Myatt placed an advertisement selling what he called genuine fakes for 150 pounds. Myatt was a former art teacher who had left the profession to take care of his children after his wife had departed the family home. 
In very poor financial straits, one of his buyers, John Drew, sold some of the paintings as genuine artworks, and he and Myatt gradually formed a partnership. Eventually, they sold more than 200 forged works, and Myatt estimated that Drew paid him nearly 300,000 pounds. What was even more incredible was that their clients were not just private buyers, but esteemed and trusted houses like Christie's and Sotheby's. Like Keating, Myatt's notoriety once he and Drew had been caught and arrested led to his work becoming successful in its own right, and he's made many television appearances, along with his and Drew's story being dramatized in books and on screen. Whether for mere profit or the satisfaction brought on by passing one's work off as equal to that of an established genius, it would appear that even forgers like Keating and Myatt follow Rodin's dictate that art is merely the pleasure of the mind, with another of the great sculptor's caveats added to it. At a different time than his sunny garden conversations with Xell, Rodin also said, the artist must create a spark before he can make a fire, and before art is born, the artist must be ready to be consumed by that fire of his own creation. Michelangelo, Rubens, Yuan, Keating, and Myatt certainly did that. Whether that fire is worth the risk of deceiving those willing to pay large sums for the work of great masters is of course a moral question, sure to keep intrigued minds occupied for a very long time. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.